Hey, this is Little Top, Big Nikki. Hello, everybody, and welcome back for another episode of Little Talks with Big Nikki. I am your host, Big Nikki. This episode is going to be a little bit different than previous episodes. Um, as many of you know, there's been a lot going on in our world, um, specifically here in America, and I want you to know I thought long and hard about this, I prayed about this, I have struggled with this, um, whether I use my podcast platform to address things going on and address my thoughts, uh, things that I have been seeing, how I've kind of been feeling, um, etc. And I just want you to know moving forward in this podcast that this is the hardest podcast that I have had to record yet. Um, this is not easy. I did not know when I started a podcast that I was going to have to make a decision like this to use my platform to speak on things um, that are so important. And I just want you to know that I don't take this lightly. I have been struggling for the past two days now. I'm recording this on Monday, June 1st. Um, I just want to give that timestamp so if anything changes or happens, um, people don't think I'm just out of date or out of touch with, you know, what's going on. Um, this, this is very hard, um, because I have been feeling, wrestling with myself, that no matter what I say, um, A, it's not enough, um, and B, it's not going to be good enough. Um, there's going to be people who find problems with what I say, or not like how I say it, or um, disagree with me. There might be people who hate me. I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know once this goes out, um, what's kind of going to happen. But what I do know, after listening to a message this morning by Stephen Furtick, and Pastor John Gray, who, which I will uh, be linking that in the description, um, that I can't just say nothing. And even though I might not get it right, and even though I might not make everybody happy, I have to use the platform that I have built to say something. So I am going to do my best to be sensitive, to be empathetic, to be sympathetic, um, but to also be um, a Christian, first and foremost, above all else. Um, when I come on here, I represent um, the kingdom, and um, especially with something like this, that is not something I'm taking lightly. Um, I'm probably going to get emotional at several points, um, because this has been a lot. And if I feel that way, I can't imagine how my brothers and sisters of color are feeling. So, with that being said, I don't really have specific talking points, because there's so much I could say. But I'm going to do the best I can um, to articulate things um, and, and just talk, just talk. Um, I have already been in conversations, I will start with this, I've already been in conversations um, with uh, some of my uh, black friends and I 
invited one of them in particular to come onto the podcast, um, and she said she is willing. Um, and this is something that I actually have kind of wanted to do since before um, any of the recent events happened. Um, when I started the podcast, I was thinking, you know, it would be really good to sit down um, with a friend of mine, a person of color, and have a conversation about race relations here in the U.S. and and how they are feeling and what they're going through and what's going on. And um, I kind of already had that in the back of my mind, but I, of course, never have done it up until this point. Um, So with everything going on this week, um, I did talk to her last week and she said that she would be um, very um, okay with having that conversation. And I am looking forward to doing that as soon as possible. For those of you that don't know, um, I do live um, in downtown Cleveland, and we are under curfew. Um, It started on Saturday um, evening, and it has been pretty much continuous um, through right now. They're saying uh, tomorrow, which is Tuesday um, evening at 8 p.m., it will be lifted. Um, They've already extended it once they might extend it again. I don't know. Um, so not really leaving, um, my apartment, um, not really leaving downtown. Technically as a resident, I'm able to, but getting back in is still a struggle. have to have proof of residency, have to go to the right checkpoint. Um, it's, it's just like a lot. Um, so that being said, I, last week, um, knew I needed to prep two more podcast episodes for the coming weeks. That's I kind of work one a, or two ahead, if that makes sense. And I kind of flipped through my notebook, kind of was like looking at ideas, and nothing was really coming to me. I didn't really have any idea of what I wanted to talk about. Nothing was like really sticking out. And then when Saturday came... And the protests were happening here in Cleveland on my street, um, blocks, a couple blocks from me. Um, And then the curfew happened, like things just kind of kept going across uh, America and I'm on social media, maybe a little too much, I don't know. And I'm seeing this and I'm seeing that, I'm hearing this and I'm hearing that. And I just felt like last night as I'm laying in bed trying to figure this out, crying because I'm just confused and frustrated and just a range of emotions of I don't even know where they're coming from um I felt like God was just like I left the door open for these conversations to be had um so I felt like there was a reason why I couldn't think of a podcast topic last week there was a reason why I couldn't prep or I didn't have time to record last week because I think God knew that something was coming that was more important than anything I could talk about, um, and that needed to be addressed. So, um, all that to say, this week I am speaking, obviously, alone, um, but I hope that for next week's episode I can have my friend, um, come on here with me and we can have a conversation, um from two sides because I don't want this to be a one-sided conversation Um, because I feel like that's a really big part of the problem is uh, not enough people are talking. Um, There's things to be done on a grand scale um, politically, legislatively, um, but there's also work to be done on a micro scale that starts in your heart, that starts in your home, and um, that starts with the people in your circle, in your community, in your city. Um, so with that being said, I'm very excited to have this be a two-person conversation, a dialogue. And that's why I was very hesitant on um, doing kind of like a, a precursor to that video um, on my own. Um, because I'm not perfect and I might mess some things up. What I will say is that I have been confronted in 
challenged in the last 48 hours um, with my whiteness. And I can't speak to the experience that black people and people of color have in this country because I obviously have not experienced it and probably will not experience anything similar for myself. However, what I can speak on is, as a white person, what what this journey of growth can look like for you. Um, I have never been as close to this issue as I was being here Saturday um, with the protest. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna separate these two because I know I know that they are not one and the same. There was a peaceful protest scheduled in the afternoon, and that Pete and that protest, as far as I have heard from people who were there. They were peaceful. However, there was almost like a secondary um, portion to that protest that turned more violent. Um, And I want to separate these two because I want people to understand that I fully support um, a protest. I fully support marches. I fully support gatherings of people and walks and um, a, a visual representation of a community coming together of allies partnering with people of color um, to say that enough is enough and justice does need to be served. I fully support that. What I will say is I do not fully support vandalism, property damage, and violence. And I know that that is a stance that is maybe not popular with a lot of people. But I say that and I want to follow it up. I want to follow it up with this statement. I don't agree with it, but I understand why some people either are participating in it or are okay with it happening. I understand and I can empathize with the fact that they are tired of having the same conversation. They are tired of the same marches. They are tired of the same negotiations and they want to be heard and they feel like they are still not being heard so they are lashing out I can empathize with that and as um, my pastor uh, Pastor Noah said you can see or you don't have to see eye and eye eye to eye sorry you don't have to see eye to eye to walk hand in hand So I personally do not support um, normalizing vandalism, property damage, violence. I don't agree with that at all. Um, You can disagree with me, but that does not mean that I do not support the overall cause. Um, That does not mean that I do not see the injustice that is going on. And that does not mean that I do not think that Black Lives Matter, because I do. So something I want to touch on about being white is almost an ignorance that some of us have due to misinformation and little education. For the first time ever in my life yesterday, I read uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail. I have never read this in my life. I never had to. 
it was never really talked about. Sure, we had history class. Sure, we talked about civil rights movement. Sure, we talked about Dr. Martin Luther King. We talked about that he was assassinated. We talked about that he was peaceful in his um, ways of trying to bring about change. Something I deeply respect and I still hold true to what I just said. I believe that um, it, it needs to be peaceful. And I do not condone violence or destruction of other people or their property. Um, I don't believe that two wrongs make a right. And I never, I never had to read this. Um, And what's even almost a little more scary to me is I've at least heard of it. I've at least heard of the letter from Birmingham jail. And I knew it was out there. But I talked to two friends of mine yesterday, um, who also white, and they said they've never even heard of it. And that's scary to me. Because I think that that is a very small example of how the system is broken and how it is played into the white race's favor. Why are we not being educated about this? Why is this not being even more talked about? I mean, I took a African American studies class. Um, it was part of my intro level requirements uh, being at Cleveland State University and I never had to read this. Um, so I read it yesterday. That was the bulk of what I did. Um, It's not very long, but I wanted to make sure I was thorough with it. And I took probably about four pages of notes. Things that stood out to me. And I was challenged. I have great respect um, for MLK. And I have a great respect for his work um, after... This pretty much being one of the first things I've read of his, um, I have nothing more to say than he's he was a brilliant man. Um, it was very beautifully written, the fact that he wrote it in a jail cell. The fact that he tied his experience to that of like Paul um, when the early church was starting. Um, that's in you know the New Testament of the Bible. Um, all, all the way around, it, it's a beautiful piece of work. Um, so I want to say this to all the white people that maybe never heard of it, um, or maybe you're like me and you heard of it, but you've never read it. I really encourage you to read Letter from Birmingham Jail. Um, I hope to be reading even more of MLK's work, um, in the coming days, in the coming weeks. Um, but I think that, I think that this is important to try to understand the anger and the frustration that people of color are feeling um, and they've had enough and I can't even begin to again understand fully what that feels like Um, but it hurts my heart knowing that they feel that way. Um, I'm sorry if I'm kind of bouncing thoughts, but I'm trying to make this flow and make sense in the best way possible. Um, I just want, I just want to touch real quick on George Floyd specifically. For anyone wondering, no, I did not watch the video. Because I didn't have to. I saw... I think I saw it was maybe like a 15 second, 30 second. One of those quick, like, just a snippet of it. Um, on Instagram or Twitter or both. From the from the full length. Um, I heard like a 9 or 10 minute video from that full length video. It was like a clip of it. And I saw the picture... Um, I think I saw the still image first, um, and I 
I saw a white officer with his knee on a black man's neck. And I have never been so sure in my life, personally, that we have a big problem, that something is wrong. So I didn't watch the full video because I didn't need to. I didn't need to know anything more than the fact of a man has his knee on another man's neck. I didn't need to know anymore to fully support the fact that there are injustices being done and injustices that have been happening for years now. And I want to apologize um, in general for not being more aware before, maybe not caring as much as I should have before. Um, I am 21. I don't really know if that's an excuse. It's I feel like it's a little bit harder when you're younger and you're trying to shape the world into perspective, but you know, you're, you know, still young and trying to figure things out. I'm not saying that that's an excuse, but I'm just saying I'm sorry that I did not take this more seriously before. Um, but what I do know is I'm taking it seriously now. And I think as a white person, instead of trying to defend your whiteness, instead of being ignorant and apathetic to the people of color's situation, in America specifically, I think the best thing you can do is to just say, I didn't know then, I didn't understand then, but I understand now, and I am with you now. Even if you weren't against them before. I was never against Black Lives Matter. I was never against that. But I didn't fully understand the severity, the extent. And so now I do. When it came to Black Lives Matter a few years ago, I am... I'm going to be 100% honest with you all. I'm going to be 100% vulnerable because I think as much as it is important to have a conversation between, you know, a white person and a black person in this time and and trying, um, as Stephen Furtick and John Gray did so well, trying to bridge the gap when it comes to these justice issues and these racial issues that have been so long in the making that is so important but I think and what I want to try to do on this podcast is that it's also important for you as a white person to have a conversation with yourself and it is okay to mature it is okay to grow, to think differently. Um, that is okay. And it is welcomed. And it should be welcomed by everyone. Um, in years past, when I saw Black Lives Matter trending on social media, in the news, over a black person who was wrongly killed by a police officer. My response was, but all lives matter. I was one of those people, and I said that, and I meant that at that time, because I didn't understand the analogy 
that I understand now, that I'm seeing now. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen it on social media where, you know, they were talking about, there was like this little cartoon meme and it was like, okay, but like, my house is on fire, so are you as the, you know, hypothetical fire department going to go around the neighborhood and spray every single other house which isn't on fire or are you going to give attention to the house that's burning and that made it make so much more sense so as a white person if you're still not understanding the saying black lives matter they're not saying that all other lives don't matter equally because they do but what they are saying is black lives need the attention right now because certain people certain um, groups are making it seem as though maybe they don't matter their house is on fire and We need to help them put it out. Um, So that's just one example as a white person of something I did not understand a few years ago. Again, not that I was ever against Black Lives Matter, but I didn't understand why we were saying Black Lives Matter instead of All Lives Matter. And now it's like I'm, I'm coming into that understanding. Um, I've, I've grown into that understanding. The other thing as a white person that is difficult to kind of have a grasp on sometimes is white privilege. Because, for instance, me and probably a lot of other people, you know, we're like, I, I haven't felt really privileged at all um and Billie um, Eilish put out her statement I think it was I can't remember yesterday or the day before um and I'm paraphrasing here but she basically said like you like as a white person she's addressing white people in this statement saying like you may not feel the privilege Because you had other hardships, socioeconomic, um, there was like different examples, um, socioeconomics, like the only one I can think of right now, but that's like the one I kind of identified with. So I really felt like she was like speaking to me in this moment because I was like, oh, that's me. Like I've never really felt privileged because like I, I don't come from like a wealthy family. I come from the, you know, middle of nowhere and like we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, we weren't poor, but we weren't, like, rich either. I've never felt like I've had, like, a great advantage. But what I have to realize is whether I like it or not, whether I mean it to happen or not, I do, in some situations, have an advantage just because of my skin color. And there again, I may still not fully understand that, I still may not fully, like, can think of maybe, I can't think of, like, a situation where that happened necessarily, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And I think that that is a big point, is just because you don't understand it, or just because you can't fully grasp it because you haven't had your own experience with it, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It does exist, unfortunately. And... I think instead of being guilty or like feeling guilty, like, oh, I'm sorry, I have like white privilege. It's not really like you invited it. It's not like you yourself were, were, you know, were like asking for it. But instead of being guilty about it, just acknowledge it and use it to benefit, to empower people of color and their mission right now for justice to uplift them and and help and help them create 
change for the better. That's, that's what you can do with your white privilege. Don't be sorry for it. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge that you have it. Even if you don't understand how or why or when, just acknowledge that you have it and use it for the betterment of people of color and what they are trying to achieve. That is my advice on that front. I want to also preference all this with I do not know everything. I am probably... I am probably the least equipped, the least uneducated on civil rights issues and, and you know, all of this stuff. I do not know a lot. I don't know a lot. I, I just read the letter from Birmingham jail yesterday, okay? And I'm almost 22 years old. What does that tell you? I am probably not the best person to speak on this, but... I I had to say something and again I want to address this from kind of like the the white person side of things of you know you need to just own own it acknowledge it and then figure out what you can do to help invite change and help invite um a difference being made. <laughs> I This is another thing that I already know some people might not agree with me on, and that's okay. Um, because, like Stephen Furtick said, if I waited for everything I said to be perfect and everything I say, you know, that people will agree with and, you know, support, then I'll be waiting forever to say anything. Um, I keep stating, keep stating, I see the injustice happening, I don't understand why it's happening, it's so hard for me to fathom that after all these hundreds of years, that this is still an issue, like, I am mind blown that there are still people out there that would abuse their power so much to the point of of taking a life so unnecessarily. It, It blows my mind. And I say that to say Black lives do matter. I'm all for that. I will support that to the end. Yes, they do. They do matter. And I just want to make clear that I do, again, this is personal. I, I do not speak for all white people when I say this. I, I'm just speaking for me. I do not agree with the utter hatred and disrespect and violence against police officers. I cannot support that because first and foremost, um, I am a Christian and if you are a follower of Christ, regardless of the color of your skin, You are, you know, a a child of God. And I do not believe that all officers are bad. I do not believe that all officers are racist. And 
I have seen videos from both sides recently. I have seen the videos where officers are taking a knee with protesters. Videos where officers are walking with protesters. Videos where officers are hugging protesters. And I am retweeting those things and I am liking those things because that is the picture that I think we all should be striving to create. That is the America that I want to live in. Where it's people who are recognizing that there is wrong being done, but they are not perpetuating generalizations and lumping people into grand categories because they're this career path or they're this color or you know they're they're this way it's it's not all of them i understand that the system that america has been created on is not helping anything within our law enforcement and our justice system and i understand that change there needs to be had i will 100% agree with that but i cannot condone and I do not agree with the the violence and the hatred towards police officers just because they're a police officer. Um, because I understand that the root of this issue is that more times than not um, in these situations, the police officers have abused their power um, and have gotten away with things that they should not have gotten away with and if you were anybody else you probably wouldn't have gotten away with um but that to me does not make it okay to attack someone just because of their profession um i will say i will say this though i have seen plenty of videos coming out and these are not from media sources okay because this is kind of, I think, the power we have right now. It, it's a it's a slippery slope. It's a dangerous thing. Because the, the media can be so one-sided and you don't know what is what. And, and they'll report on this, but they won't, won't report on this. Um, I know here in Cleveland, everyone was saying, like, the media is making it about the riots and, um, you know... People were, were mad that we are under curfew now because now people can't protest. And there's levels to that. And, and maybe I don't understand, you know, what that is for somebody else. But for me, I did see people coming out and saying, listen, there was peaceful protest happening this group over here started some crap. This group over here started to burn things and to smash windows and, and to loot. And, um, but, but there were this, it was supposed to be pre- peaceful and this group had to like ruin it, you know, for everyone. Cause then it became kind of like an unsafe situation for everybody involved. Um, which is why they've imper- imposed a curfew because they, our, our city is destroyed um, right now, and I understand that a lot of people are saying it's just buildings, it's just property, it's not a human life. Um, I get that, and I am by no means saying that property is more important than a human life. Um, however, like I said, I do not condone um, that type of destruction, um, and it is very upsetting to see and it is very um it's very different um the fact that I'm I'm under a curfew I've never had to deal with anything like this so maybe I just I I don't know um but it's it's very like just weird that I can't it's like stricter than quarantine like I can't really leave my apartment um I can't walk downtown like at least during quarantine like you could walk downtown um, I understand why the city did what they did, um, and I and I respect that they're trying to keep everybody safe. Um, but it's 
it's like hard for me to understand um, that this is kind of what it came to and I feel like it wasn't supposed to come this far and it and it unfortunately did um, but back to what I was saying about um, sorry I got like a little sidetracked but back to what I was saying about the the police officers I have seen the videos um, not from the media um, because these are these are people who are there posting you know like pretty much right away sometimes from like their cell phones like they're in it they're there they're they're videoing and then they post it to Twitter or Instagram or wherever and I'm seeing the police brutality that is occurring I am I, I am seeing it and I want everyone to know that I am not okay with that I am not okay with a, a police SUV driving through a crowd of people um, I am not okay with a 10 year old girl getting maced by an officer um, I am not okay with these things and I hate I hate so much that this is happening because I'm like, I'm just sitting here like, what are you guys doing? I, I, talking to the officers like, what are y'all doing when you're doing this? I've seen videos of them, people like not even like, they're just sitting there. They are being peaceful. And these officers are like pushing them over, um, knocking them down. It's, it's so unnecessary. It's so unnecessary and it's so sad to me that in cases where people are being orderly, they're still, you know, getting, you know, abused pretty much. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Alexandria Cortez, um, she was like, because I follow her on Twitter, and she was like, in, in no circumstances is it okay for you to drive an SUV through a crowd of people? People have done that in other countries, like Paris, and that's been terrorism. You know? Um, that's not okay under any circumstance. Um, so I say that I do not condone hatred and violence on police officers just because they are a person in a uniform, but I also am saying that I see that they are not without fault um, in some of these situations. And again, that doesn't mean all of them, but I, I, I see, and if anything to me with these protests happening in those situations, the cops are almost ma just making it more clear that there's an issue, that there's an abuse of power. I see them pushing, like, white people, though. I mean, there's there's white people at these rallies, you know, this... Almost in, in that moment, it's not even about, like, the, the color anymore. It, it started off, you know, that a, a black man was wrongly, like, you know, um, murdered by a white cop. But in that moment, in these videos that I'm seeing, it's like... It's not even about the color anymore. It's about the police not being policed. Um, but I stand by what MLK said, and this is why I, I took the notes that I did, um, that, there, that there should not be violence. Um, I understand a lot of people are saying, that this is what this country was built on, um, was, you know, riots and, and violence. And, and you know what? The, you're right. You know, you're right. It, we had, that's how we, you know, we went to war. Boston Tea Party, sure, we, you know, we did riot-like things. People died, people were injured. Um, for us to gain freedom um, and gain other things, but... That doesn't make it right. Um, this country was built 
as you know these people are saying on on you know the riots and and violence um and that's absolutely correct um but unfortunately and and where this problem is stemming from is that it was also built on the backs of of slaves and that's not right either so i don't i don't agree with saying in one breath like oh well this is how america was made was you know with riots and war so that's what we're gonna do now to fix the problem but america was also made on the backs of slaves which is the problem that we have been trying to fix um for years now is that they that the black community had has been oppressed for so long so i just i don't I don't see how two wrongs make a right. I don't see how violence um, and more violence uh, creates change. Um, But again, I am empathetic in, in knowing that in these cases, some people are just so tired that they don't know what else to do. They're so sick and tired. They don't know what else to do to feel heard. Or, or to feel like they're achieving anything because they've been talking for a long time and it seems like nobody's listening. So that's that's kind of my take on on that part of, of things. I, I can't I can't support hatred towards another group of people. Um, I just I can't. I was, I was further challenged yesterday reading the letter from Birmingham jail um, because of some of the things that um, MLK wrote and um, I'm just going to read this uh this quote because this is what this is what kind of made me stop in my tracks Um, he wrote the negro's greatest stumbling block is the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice who prefer who prefers a negative peace which is the absence of tension to a positive peace which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action. He then goes on to say, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And so I had to sit with myself and say, have I been lukewarm? Have I been moderate? Um, Because I know I've said that before. I've said, I agree with you in the goal you seek. And I will continue to say that. But then I say, I can't agree with your methods of action. Now here, um, from what I got from it, he is addressing someone who was upset that they even were having protests, sit-ins, boycotts, um, non-violent actions. And so here we are in 2020 and you know, I still feel, like I said, that I do not support rioting and destruction of property, but I have to read that sentence of, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, and ask myself, you know, if I am still not thinking about this correctly. Um, But the more I read, the more the term nonviolent came up the more the term 
of a nonviolent tension um, was presented by him. So, and again, not everyone's going to agree with me and think how I think, and that's okay. Um, but again, that goes back to also not saying anything. Um, I haven't really posted a statement on on my social media. Um, I've just been sharing what others have been saying that I agree with, or sharing, um, you know, things that things that I feel people need to see. Um, again, I, as I said in the beginning of this, I am. A Christian first and foremost and that doesn't mean I always get things right and that doesn't mean that I'm perfect but what that does mean is I am supposed to show love um, to people that don't love me back um, and that's very hard and one of the quotes that I heard that kind of shook me, um, it's uh, this video going around on Instagram stories um, talking about um, black parents having to um, explain to their kids pretty much what to do if you encounter a police officer. And the one girl who was older, probably around driving age, her mom you know, was saying, you know, like, telling her what to do, um, to not incite any problems with a, with an officer. Um, and she, and she said something that even the mom was like, wow, like I didn't even think about that, um, in this way. And she said like, we for, she's like, it's, it's almost like a, a person, like a close relationship where they do something and I forgive them but they keep doing it to me just in a different way and it becomes harder and harder to forgive and I'm sure that's how a lot if not all people of color are feeling right now been feeling for years. So I am not here to tell anyone who's a person of color what you should think, what you should feel, um, what is right, what is wrong. You have to make those determinations for yourself. Um, And again, even if you believe that rioting is the answer and you feel like looting is is you know what needs to be done um even though i i may not agree with you on that point that does not mean that i am not going to still stand with you um in support for changes that need to desperately be made um i feel Going back to the images that people don't share, um, there's plenty of bad, but the, and by people I mean like the media, like the mainstream media probably won't pick this up, but plenty of uh, police brutality happening, and I recognize that, and I'm very upset by that. Um, But there's also the portion, um, and some of it has caught mainstream media, which is good, um, but there's also the portion of photos and videos of um, of peace and civility between a black person and a white officer. Um, and that is the America that I want to see um, in the end of all this. That is the America that we need to work towards being. Um, I believe that there can be injustice, but still be love. I believe that there can be anger, but still be compassion. 
Um, Someone said on Twitter, two things can exist and it it doesn't negate the other, basically, is what they said. Um, Two things can can coexist in the same space. Um, And I... And I think that that's... That's the... That's the goal. Is... To have... Injustice... Be met with justice. To have... um, Equality... Be met by actionable... showings of equality Um, and at the end of the day I'm talking about the the people with good intention in their heart Um, everybody just wants to go home the black man who's walking down the street he just wants to go home the police officer who's almost at the end of his shift he just wants to go home At the end of the day, everybody just wants to go home. And everyone should have the right to return home. And I hope that very soon we see that shift happen where it's not just people saying it anymore, but it's actually happening. And... As a, as a white person, anything I say can be construed as misingenuous, disingenuous, sorry, um, disingenuous, non-authentic. I'm jumping on the bandwagon because sometimes that's how it seems when something like this happens, that everybody's just jumping on a bandwagon because they don't want to upset anybody um, or they, they don't want to ruffle feathers. Um, or be called out for being racist. Um, And it's easy. And this is why I, again, this is just me personally. I've watched, like, what I've been posting. I have not posted a lot. And maybe I should be posting more. But to me, a, a post only does so much. And yes, it's important. But then it's like, what are you, what are you doing? Besides posting, is my question. Um, for people um, who are white, um, like, what what else are you doing? And that's a hard question to answer because then we feel like, what else can we do? Um, in the description, I'm going to be linking um, a text number for a petition to be signed for George Floyd, um, which I signed, and um, also going to be linking um, Stephen Furtick and uh, John Gray discussed how they kind of created something back in 2018 um, called like uh, the Bridge. I think I think that's the name of it, um, and I will be linking the website to that below. Um, John Gray was very adamant about education, about awareness, um, that we as the church um, needs to be at the forefront of bridging the gap between whites and blacks, you know, those bridges that, or the gaps that could uh, need filled. Um, that, that the church is the forefront. Um, and he expressed similar frustration, which I found was interesting to that of Dr. Martin Luther King, who said he was uh, disappointed in the white church for standing by silently. And, and not only the fact that they were standing by silently, but they were also pretty much actively opposing um, desegregation. And he said, um, some of this is paraphrased, but he basically said the early church went forward with conviction. Where is that conviction now? They were labeled as disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. 
but now they are a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. The average community is consoled by the church's often vocal sanction of things as they are. Um, I don't think this is a time to keep things as they are. And um, I think that a website like that, having forums and discussions and educational resources um, for especially for people um, who are white to look at and go through. Um, that's, to me, what you can do right now. Um, it's not about being the loudest on social media. It's not about posting the most things on your story. Um, it's about educating yourself, allowing your mind to be open to understanding and to change and to empathy. And um, I might look back on this podcast a year from now and be like, I don't even agree with myself on some things I said, you know? Um, And that's okay. And that's good. And that is warranted. Um, Especially right now. So I'm going to link some things in the description, um, whether it's a petition, places to give money if you are able. Um, I know if you're like me, you're still trying to recuperate from the coronavirus um, financially um, in those terms. and um, Or if it's just a resource um, like the website I just talked about, um, I'll also link the message by Stephen Furtick and uh, John Gray. He said something really beautiful. Again, I'm paraphrasing because he was talking. I couldn't write down fast enough. Um, But he basically said at the end of his talk with Furtick, um, until the blood, uh, Christ's blood, gets on your mind and your heart, the change will never reach our hands. Um, So, again, I think as a follower of Christ, your main priority should be How do you handle your enemies, whoever you see your enemy as? How do you handle opposition? How do you handle hatred and violence? How are you supposed to respond to those things? Um, And we are supposed to be a light. Um, We are supposed to be uh, an example of Jesus. And again, I'm not saying I have any place to state that this is easy. Because I know it, it, it's not. Because there's so much anger and frustration and tiredness. Um, but trying to go about this from whatever side you're on. Whatever, whatever place you find yourself in. Opening your, yourself up to asking, God, how would you have me respond? What would you have me do? What would you have me say? Sometimes it's as simple as sending a text message. I have a couple of friends I've sent text messages to already today and just just simply saying, I'm here for you. I love you. That's it. That's all that needs to be said sometimes. Um, sometimes less is more. Um, <sighs> this is not the end of this conversation um like I said I plan to continue it as a dialogue here on the podcast um I don't even know if I said everything that I was supposed to say but I'm just or if I said it in the way I was supposed to say it but I'm just leaving it in God's hands um I I prayed before I started talking um that you know he would just take control of my tongue and however I'm saying things that's that's just how that's how I said it I guess um I'm sorry if you don't think I said everything right um I am I am open to conversation I uh I do not want to be attacked I do not want to be persecuted because of anything I said or my views or 
anything like that, but I'm open to constructive conversation. Things that maybe I'm not aware of, a viewpoint that maybe I haven't heard from someone else or thought of on my own. Um, I'm, I'm open and, and, I'm, and I'm peaceful and I, and I hope that whoever sees this, I understand my platform's not that big, but whoever sees this, wherever they see it, I hope that comment sections and social media will just stay a place of, of peace and constructive conversations um, and not turn ugly or in, insensitive or um, angry. Um, that is the last thing that I, that I want to come of this. read one more thing that I I really would want to read the full four pages <laughs> to you guys um, but I really want to read just one more um, quote from the letter from uh, Birmingham jail and then I think it's only fitting that I close this out in prayer um, if you want to stay for that go ahead if you're not comfortable with that um, I mean you can sign off, log off, click off, whatever. Um, I just feel like I would be doing a disservice um, to not openly and publicly um, pray um, over this situation. So um, from the letter, though, one last quote. Um, he says towards the end, I gradually gained bit of satisfaction from being considered an extremist. For was not Jesus an extremist of love? So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists from hate? Or I'm sorry, will we be extremists for hate or love? Will we be extremists for the prevention of injustice or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? Um, I just love that. Was not Jesus an extremist of love? Um, and that's what I'm going to try to be. Um, that's I feel like that's what I always try to be, but even more so um, now being vigilant of, you know, Someone, if someone wants to call me extreme, hopefully I'll be an extremist of love. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for listening, watching. Um, again, this was not easy. Um, I may have not done things right or perfectly, um, but I, I did, I did what I could do and and say right now. Um, so I'm gonna close this out. Um, prayer and uh, I, I hope that you will be back to listen or watch the podcast um, in the coming week um, hopefully um, with my friend and we can have a good dialogue discussion um, pertaining to all of this as well so yeah uh, Heavenly Father uh, we just come to you um, Lord I thank you for this platform, um, for you allowing me to use my voice to reach whoever this is meant to reach. Um, Father, I pray for our hearts, for those, whether we're white, black, in uniform, it doesn't matter. Um, I pray that your Holy Spirit will intercede where words that I say or other people say maybe can't, they can't reach where you can, um, in the depths of our hearts and our souls. We know that this is a heart issue. Um, it's a posture issue. And Father, we just pray that you will turn apathetic hearts into empathetic hearts 
Father, we pray that you will turn hearts and minds of injustice into those that will be for justice. Father, we just pray over our nation right now, as divided as people can be, that those hearing my voice right now, whether they are believers or not, that they will be extremists of love and not hate, that they will feel the anger and the sadness and the frustration of things that have been going on for far too long, but they will use those in powerful, impactful, yet peaceful ways to make change. Father, I pray for every person of color that you will uplift their spirits, that you will empower them and give them a strength. You know they're tired. You know they're weary. And Father, we just know that you are able to do more than any of us ever could. So we invite you into the situation. We invite you into the conversation. Father, I pray that for our leaders, they invite you into the legislation. Father, I pray for those who are angry and hurting, that their pain will not be ignored, that their pain will not be excused, but their pain will be heard and felt and shared, and that it will move us in a positive direction for change and true equality for all people. Father, we know that you feel that black lives matter. And Father, I just pray for everyone to align their hearts and their minds with you and your words and your behavior and your actions that you will speak through us through this, that you will be seen through this, that you will be known through this. Father, thank you for our leaders. We pray over them. We pray for wisdom, for guidance, for courage to speak out and to stand out. And we thank you. We thank you for all of us coming together and trying to find a solution. Trying to end that should have been ended long ago. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in these moments. We pray that you will continue to be with us in these moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.